Are we recording? We will be recording. So go ahead and go ahead and start the event. All right. Uh, we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Dwayne, Mercy Bookstore. I'll be your opening and closing host. Uh, we have copies of the book in stock. Feel free to go online and order or come in and get one. Uh, I should have some signed copies at some point in the not distant future. Uh, please welcome Judy Bentley and Craig Romano, who are both uh, historians. Well, she's more than a story, I guess. Avid hikers, experts, ex uh, what's the word for it? Uh, quite comprehensive writers. And we are featuring, of course, we have copies of the new book. Hiking Washington's History, second edition with full color and all that uh, laid out. And I'll be back at the end to make sure it's all good. But in the meantime, you know, Judy and Craig, take it away. Okay, thank you. And we will start. Whoops. Okay, with the uh, acknowledgement, uh, and a very appropriate acknowledgement for this book uh, that most of the Historic hikes in this book are on native land. Um, this is Ken Workman, great, 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 great grandson of Chief Self, leading a hike in the West Lomish Greenbelt, which is one of the new uh, trails in this edition of the book. So um, we acknowledge the, uh, the presence of his ancestors on this land. We're, Craig and I are both going to talk a little bit about how we got into uh, this particular subject of historic trails. I uh, moved here in 1981, lived in the suburbs. I could follow a social trail under the power lines and then a deer trail and get to a trail along Coal Creek in which I began to notice chunks of coal in the creek, um, a locomotive turntable, and a big uh, dark hole in the ground. And I was just amazed how close the history was to where I was living and how it's how it seemed to be completely removed from the suburban developments on one side and a parkway on the other. You could walk along the creek and hear nothing uh, of, the, of that contemporary development. So that aroused my curiosity. I uh, wanted to find out I like to hike, wanted to find out who'd been on the trail before, uh, how this trail came to be and where it went. Uh, and particularly, I think it's also kind of a search for uh, our place in this land. Uh, many of us move uh, around a lot as Americans and to find how we are connected to the land that we are now living in. And that's what I hope to find in, in researching and writing this book, right? Yeah, um, uh, I actually, I grew up in New England, surrounded by history. I, I, I lived just a few miles from the Robert Frost farm, a couple of miles from Concord and Lexington and uh, Walden Pond. So I've always been intrigued about, about history. Uh, when I moved out here in 1989, um, I actually pursued a degree in history uh, from the University of Washington. And, you know, a lot of people, it's a lot newer out here when it comes to European uh, the, the European, European American history, but there is a lot of history out here and our trails are loaded with it. And just like Judy, uh, I, I really appreciate the hiking aspects of trails, but also the stories that are out there, the people that were before us, the events that occurred out here. And sometimes it, it, it's quite noticeable. Other times it takes a little snooping around and, and, and this is exactly why um, our book is, it, it will, will help you realize parts about these trails, hikes that you might have been doing all along and then all of a sudden, wow, I never, I never saw that aspect of it before. Uh, it's fascinating history out here. And uh, Judy and I, uh, we've covered the entire state. Uh, in, in, in I, I, it's just, uh, it, it was a, a real love to bring my, my love of hiking and, and trail running to history together. So this is a great project. And I'm so glad Judy uh, brought me on this project for this, this second edition. So, so that's my love for history. And this second edition has a uh, a lot more trail narrative in it um, and photographs, some of which, many of which Craig provided and good maps. So it's, it's a, an upgrade in terms of uh, user friendliness, we hope. So we're going to give you kind of an overview of the kinds of trails, the history of these trails all over the state. It covers the whole territory. And if we have time, we'll go into depth on a few hikes. So we'll start with this uh, Washington Territory 1853 map. 
and unless you have a huge screen, it's probably not easy to see a lot, but you get the idea that there were not many trails on land. The way you got around this territory in the 1850s was by water. So the Columbia River, very important um, uh, waterway. It is the trail that, that this followed a lot. Uh, of course, we have the explorers coming in from the coast and down the Strait of Juan de Fuca into Puget Sound. There is one trail on this map, uh, which is probably the Longmire Party coming in 1853 through Natchez Pass to Puget Sound. So you'll see in a lot of this history that crossing the Cascades, uh, finding um, land routes was one of the goals of, of people who were moving in. We'll start though with the ancient pathways. Um, this book includes hikes that are 7,000 years old, and that's just to me, uh, an amazing um, resonance to have. Um, there, at first, there were game trails. The O'Neill expedition through the Olympics followed the elk. That was the trail they were following. There were no other trails going east to west through the Olympic mountains. But there were quite a few uh, native uh, passes, trails through the passes in the Cascades that were used by native people. This is Cascade Pass. Um, and uh, the Okanagan Indians would cross it to get to, quote, the Great Salt Lake to the Pacific for trading. Uh, the Yakima were known to have traded with coastal people 7, 000, as many as 7,000 years ago. Um, they also uh, took summer trails into the mountains to actually just stay there and gather berries. And we'll see one of those trails in more depth. Exploration came along the coast. Um, this is Cape Flattery, the northwesternmost point of the United States, the continental United States. It's a very short trail, but it takes you to a, a dramatic um, cape and jutting out into the uh, ocean. This is the homeland of the Macaw and the Ozette who were quite proficient at sailing around uh, and maneuvering in the water here. Um, and uh, Deception Pass, Vancouver, George Vancouver sends uh, a party through this pass exploring. Uh, he thinks that it's a peninsula, but uh, in fact discovers that it's an island. So he calls this Deception Pass because it deceived him and named Whidbey Island then after the uh, person sailing through. A lot of travel along the Columbia River. Lewis and Clark Trail is kind of a famous historic trail, but in Washington, at least on the way out to the coast, it was mainly in the water uh, along the Columbia and Snake Rivers until they got to Cape Disappointment, what is now Cape Disappointment. And you see Clark here on his journey north along what's now Long Beach. Um, they got to the ocean after this uh, long trip across the continent, were very excited to explore the ocean. So he took a crew uh, walking along the beach uh, for a couple of days exploration, came across uh, a sturgeon, not this particular one, of course, but this commemorates that event. And then in the interior of the uh, territory, still traveling um, uh, by water up the Columbia, but then you would run into rapids and begin to look for overland routes. And one of the most frequently used one was through the Grand Coulee, which was dry at the time. Uh, here you see it filled with Banks Lake. But one of the prominent features of this was Steamboat Rock, which still rises uh, above Banks Lake. And then finally, we get some, uh, one of the last areas that people really settled, uh, explored was the Olympics. They were not well known, they were not well traveled by uh, Native Americans. So the Seattle Press uh, hired an expedition of men of vim and vigor. I love this photograph. Uh, of these men of them and bigger who were selected uh, to go through the Olympics um, north to south. And um, this is one of the last kind of big exploring expeditions in the territory. Another uh, overland route um, in the interior, maybe just a little out of order, but this is uh, White Bluffs and we'll talk about this a little bit more. A wagon, a ferry across the Columbia River at this point and then a road continued to the Northeast, uh, connecting military posts originally. So from these explorations, we got fur trade routes, 
and wagon roads eventually developing. Um, this was a, the Snoqualmie wagon road. Um, this, you'll see this wheel up by Denny Creek campground. Um, and there is a segment of an old wagon road that was constructed to try and go over Snoqualmie Pass. And you can still hike parts of that today. Military roads were uh, some of the first constructed, usually again on, on old Indian trails. This is one in Columbia Hills State Park. Um, this was a military road that led from the fort at the Dalles on the Oregon side, and then went to Fort Simcoe. Uh, of course, Fort Vancouver and the Western side um, came at a confluence of trails there too. So uh, we see the, the trails uh, beginning to lead from military posts. And that's where some of the first people settled um, who were coming into this territory too. From those military roads, we often got a stagecoach route. Um, these children are posing for the photographer in the stagecoach. I don't know if they got much of a ride or not, but this was on the Kalakam uh, Pass Road, which went from Wenatchee to Ellensburg. Um, it's still a road, but it's, I would not recommend it for driving. It's unless you have a, an appropriate vehicle, but it's a, a good place for hiking. So we include this as a, as an historic route through um, over the mountains there. And uh, here's another uh, wagon road that developed. Um, you might recognize that um, feature in the background. Can't, I can't talk to any of you here, but I'm assuming maybe you see it. It's Steamboat Rock. This is a wagon road right above uh, Northrop Canyon. And it was built with hand picks um, and manual labor to enable the people who had farms in this area to get their products to market. So here's a family on what's called the uh, Scheib Scheibner grade. And so this particular trail in the book has both a uh, hike, has a trail through Northrop Canyon and then a hike above it on this portion of this old wagon road. Same time as wagon roads were developing, uh, cattle routes were, uh, were uh, we're developing particularly the Caribou Trail and there are segments of the Caribou Trail in the book. Then we get to railroads and that's oh, great. Yeah, so a lot of, um, I mean, things would, would change greatly in, in Washington with the coming of the railroads, the, the, the cities would, would enlarge, um, the exploitation of natural resources. Uh, a lot of these railroads are, are obviously still in use, but um, many have been altered or changed or have been converted to trails. And, and this is remarkable, including even runs like the Great Northern. So this view here is of a snowshed that's near Stevens Pass, a uh, great place you can hike on part of the old railroad to Wellington. And Wellington was the site of one of the worst uh, uh, natural disasters in the state's history. Um, avalanche had killed, I think, 83 people there. It was just, it was sort of horrific. So, I mean, some of the, the hardships you'll, you'll see, and then uh, the, the, the immigrant labor, the, the type of work that they had to put, but you can, re, you know, you can go back in history and hike all this. So this is out the Great Northern. So we talked a lot about uh, some of the various railroad, railroads in the state, and now uh, there are several, there are, there are new trails. Um, another one is um, the, uh, the, what collectively became known as the Milwaukee Road. This is over by uh, Snoqualmie Pass, and this is part of that trail. Uh, the, Previous, the previous slide is the Snoqualmie Valley Trail. There we go, it's the Snoqualmie Va Valley Trail. And you can hike about 30 miles on this. It's a wonderful trail. And what's, and what's remarkable about this too, I mean, again, there's so much history, um, but even in King County, rapidly growing King County, this is just a few miles outside of Seattle. You get to hike an area that it kind of retains part of the old ag agricultural, uh, the farm uh, history of King County. Uh, it's just a, a great place to, to really see uh, the, the transformation of the, of the area since the, the coming of, of uh, settlers from the east and, and such. Um, then the Milwaukee Trail also, this is now uh, across the entire state. You can, you can hike, mountain bike, trail run, uh, almost across the entire state. This is now called the Palooza Cascades Trail. It's kind of a, a mouthful, but it's part of the old Milwaukee Road. There's lots of great day hikes you can do on this, including if you're not uh, claustrophobic, you can do a two mile tunnel under Snoqualmie Pass. A, a new tunnel has been built uh, for the railroad now. So you can go along the old route here. So we talked railroads uh, definitely play in. Uh, also uh, mining history, and, and there's a little bit of railroad tie in here. This is Monte Cristo, a very, very famous um, 
uh, old mining town in, in the uh, Cascades, not too far from Everett. It was uh, originally accessed by, by railroad and then by, by carriage road. Uh, there's only about a dozen structures still in there. You can hike, it's about a four mile hike to get in here. Had over 2000 people at one time, Fascinating history, including a tie-in to our uh, wonderful president, I'm sarcasm, President POTUS 45, his father uh, came here and uh, uh, had some shady business deals, and we talk about that in the book. Uh, so very, very interesting, fascinating history. Uh, so we talk about some of the mining history, and, and a lot of the state, uh, I mean, mining, at one point, I mean, we look at Washington now as Microsoft and high tech, but at one point it was all fishing, logging, mining, rough work. This is uh, the Black Warrior Mine. This is actually in North Cascades National Park. You can hike, you can hike here if you're following the Stahican River. It's a fascinating hike. And this mine was actually in operation until the 1950s. And uh, the ore would be sent down uh, by carriage road to Stahican and then on barges sent to Chelan and then out that way. So this is uh, a really neat area to check out. Um, you, you know, and we talk about a lot of these mines too. Um, also, um, just close to Seattle, a lot of people might not realize that coal was, was, was huge in, in, in the Northwest at one time. It was, it was horrible coal, too, and not that there's any such thing as good coal, but a lot of, uh, and you hear the names, Newcastle, you know, from, from England, towns like that, Black Diamond, the coal history. And so there's fascinating uh, aspects here in, in what is now uh, Bellevue and, and, and um, the town of Newcastle and all this. So we, 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 we explore some of these areas. And again, the, the ethnic and cultural diversity in these communities here as, as uh, this picture of a, a African-American um, family, this is in Roslyn. And Roslyn's a uh, fascinating town, uh, uh, long coal mining history, uh, settled um, the first wave were, were Italians that came over and then a lot of other Europeans. And then um, uh, African-Americans from the South uh, had, had come over to this area too. and, and you know, there's there's labor strifes and in, in, in all kinds of plan people and just it's a it's a fascinating area uh, to um, to see some of the ethnic and cultural diversity uh, in, in our in our history. And we talk about the coal mine trail. Another uh, fascinating aspect of, of history in Washington, and, and I think a lot of people, because there's just such, such an allure to um, to the fire lookouts, and, and of course, you know, going back to uh, one of the most famous fire lookouts in Washington is a, a native New Englander, Jack Kerouac, who um, immortalize this one here at Desolation Peak. Uh, so we talk about some of the poets, the beatnik poets that it's been out here, but also about some of the fire keeps uh, during World War II. Uh, a lot of women staffed a lot of these fire uh, these fire lookouts when the men were over fighting in the European and, and uh, Asian theaters. Uh, this, this is an old bedpost again. Uh, I think at one point we had over 600 lookouts in the state. And, and this was all um, after the big great burns in the turn of the last century. Uh, we, we really uh, increased putting these lookouts. And I think now we're only down to about 90 that are still in existence, but there's plenty of relics and artifacts. This is over on Copper Butte in the Kettle River Range in Northeastern Washington, an old bedpost. Uh, and it's also, it's a spiritual place too. It's a really fascinating area. A lot of Colville people would go up here for their vision quests and everything. So it's got a really eerie mix of, 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 uh, of the past on this too. So we talk a lot about fire lookouts. This is on Hurricane Hill, which is now an easy drive uh, paved road and then a, a 1.7 mile hike. But it used to, you have to come in from, from the Elwha back in the old days uh, uh, to, to get up here. Um, and this was um, a staff by the Chryslers, uh, very, very famous uh, people. This is, this is what their, their uh, accommodation looked like in the winter up on Hurricane Hill. And the Chryslers, um, Back, they, they built a lot of uh, backcountry um, shelters in, in, the, in the park, but they were probably perhaps most famous for their filming of the elk that they did with Disney in the 1950s. Uh, it, was, it was a landmark film back in the day. Uh, so again, we, we tie that in. They had, a, they had a, a cabin down below in the Elwha also, and we talk about the Elwha. Again, so a lot of the history here too is overlapping. There's so many um, aspects to it. I know Judy was talking about the Bailey Range and, and um, the press Trip. And if you go to Seward Park in Seattle, that's called the Bailey Peninsula because that's where Bailey, uh, who owned the press, that was his, 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 his estate there too. So it's fact we put all these pieces together. And again, it just opens up things. You see things in the state you never saw before. And, and, and I think that's the most fascinating thing about looking at the history of these places. It, it becomes more than just pretty places. So, so we also talk about roads. Uh, and even though, I mean, now we're in this, this modern era, uh, but even a lot of the original roads we were abandoned and, and now trails. This, I mean, this was a highway, a state highway that you're looking at here. Uh, well, eventually became State Route 410. 
Uh, I mean, you, you can just imagine how, how cumbersome it was to, to travel on these routes. And so a lot of the, the pioneer routes, uh, the Natchez Trail that came over with Longmire, uh, you know, eventually that would become part of Highway 410. And there's still parts of this, of, of the original um, carriage tracks out in Federation Forest State Park, which is very close to here, that you can walk back in these places and, and, and relive this, this uh, part of our history. Uh, other parts, uh, other roads we talk about, you know, where I-90 goes now, you know, one of the busiest corridors uh, in the Northwest. Um, again, from Native American travel routes, originally getting back and forth between the tribes on the East and West, and then became a, a, a major um, commerce corridor and eventually a highway, but some of the old Sunset Highway. And again, how, uh, when you think about roads now, I mean, carriages would break down on these things, the, the mud and, and, and uh, the wood and everything, it would take forever to get over these. So there's, there's actually parts of this road that you can still hike too over in Snoqualmie Pass. So, so you can hear the, the, the roar of the freeway and still walk on what used to be there. So we definitely talk about uh, a lot of the roadways as well. All right, Judy, I think you're gonna get more details on some of uh, what, what you can find in the book. Right, and I have to say how much more fun it is to give a talk with two people than to have it <laughs> just to show it. This is, we, we did, uh, we learned from each other a lot of the interesting history of the trail uh, narrative as we went along. But let's look at, we'll try and look at about four in a little more depth, but I'm going to do the history part and then uh, Craig will take you on a, a very short hike on some of these trails. So we'll start with, um, to me, one of the most fascinating trails in the, in the state is this historic route of, of the uh, Yakima and Cowlitz Indians. Um, it is now a trail in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, Cowlitz Trail number 44, but it's, it goes uh, about four to five miles of this hike is on the route that the, um, uh, uh, this particular hike that the Cowlitz people took up to Cowlitz Pass and the Yakima people came from the east side. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this um, history. It was used by people of both sides to get to the pass uh, and where they spent time gathering berries, uh, hunting, uh, socializing, gambling, trading, finding mates. Uh, and eventually over this long period of time, um, the Yakima and the Cal upper Calots, the Calots divided into the lower Calots on the river and the upper Calots intermar intermarried and um, a new, group of people uh, was created, the Titanicom. And we know about them uh, from this man here, uh, Jim Yoke, who was seated with his wife, Annie, and a step uh, child that they adopted. And they're sitting in front of a teepee, but this teepee is on the west side of the Cascades. Um, so you can see that there were characteristics of the Titanicom that crossed the, uh, crossed the, the Cascade Range. Uh, the people tended to be bilingual. They spoke both the Hopton and the Salish uh, dialects. So they were a, a, a mixture of the two cultures. Um, we know about that trail, the trail, because of the interview that Jim Yoke gave to Melville Jacobs in the 1920s. And Yoke sat in his teepee and named more than 300 names of the landscape in this particular area. And we'll see much of that. Uh, if you hike this trail today. Um, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit of, uh, more of the history and then I'll turn it over for the hike itself. But this is a historic site uh, that is not on trail 44 there, but that you may camp at if you go uh, ahead of time. This is at Lewisquit Campground. This is the confluence of the Clear Fork and the Ohanapakash rivers. It's a beautiful spot. Um, the blue because of reflecting from the sky. And this was a traditional camping spot along the trail. So when I stood there with um, Amy McHenry, who was uh, first doing this trail with me, you just had the feeling this is where people would have lived. This is where they would have camped. They, I would have stayed here too. They would have fished. You get a real sense of this, this is a place that humans have been for a long time. As they made their way towards the mountains, they collect. Uh, they made baskets on the way to collect berries. Uh, they would carve from cedar trees uh, a rectangular piece of bark and fold it in half. And you can still see uh, some of this carving on, on at the Wisconsin and other national forests. Some of this is more recent. Uh, this one may only be a hundred or more years old, but um, there are older stars on on other trees. 
And they made a very uh, rudimentary basket. This did not require the fine basket making skills that the native people had, uh, but they were using this for completely utilitarian. And I found this in the Golden Dale Museum. It's, it's not the kind of basket that ends up in a museum because it doesn't show great skill and craft, but it, uh, it, you get a real sense of how this would have worked and how it would have been made. So, oh, and one more part, um, the trail from the east side that the Yakima found uh, followed to the to Pallets Pass is not as well known uh, or defined. It's, it's actually becoming almost a lost trail. We think it went up Indian Creek from the east side. This is an overlook of the ancient village of Miawax. Uh, the Rimrock Reservoir is there in the background and it has buried the site of that village. But, uh, you can see uh, what the approach from the east side might have looked like. So you want to take us up there, Craig? Oh yeah. So this, so the trail actually, the trailhead is not very far from Mount Rainier National Park, and it's not an overly uh, popular trail with a lot of hikers. So it's a great place if you want to, you know, enjoy some solitude. It does get a little, fair amount of horseshoes, and it's probably busiest during hunting season because. As you'll, you'll soon find out, hiking there, elk are prolific in the area. During the summer, mosquitoes are prolific in the area, and that probably keeps a lot of people away. This is uh, the Soda Springs. It starts at the Soda Springs. There's a lot of history right here. There's a lot of these Soda Springs in the Cascades, in the mineral waters. There's were served as panaceas and all kinds of, uh, you know, to cure all kinds of ailments. So there was always scheming going on, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, the historical stories that we tell you about you know, deal with schemes. Um, so anyways, it starts here at the Soda Springs, and then you start off on a, on a, on a um, a pretty uh, decent trail and it's not a difficult hike. Uh, it's only about five miles one way to get to the to, to the pass in the, in, in, the, in the core area and you're only going to climb about 2,000 feet so it's pretty gradual. Um, very forested but one of the neat things you're going to follow along a creek that kind of disappears at time because so much of the area has under underground caverns. There's a lot of basalt ancient lava flows from, from uh, nearby Mount Rainier. Uh, also, what you'll notice too in the area, you are in a, you're in a little bit of rain shadow. You're on the dry side of rain here, so the forests aren't as mossy. Uh, it's a lot, a lot drier in here, but there are lakes, hundreds of them in this area. And it's very, very similar um, to the south, the Indian Heaven Wilderness, and we talk about that in the book. Also, these, these areas are very, very similar, uh, even with, the, with Native American interactions and, 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 and how important these areas were uh, to, to trade and games and, 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 and gatherings and such. Uh, so lots and lots of lakes, lots of them are named, some are named, there's um, great views of Mount Rainier, you're, you're constantly reminded of, that you're in the shadow of, of Rainier, but you're on a high plateau, and that's what's fascinating about this, and you're not going to realize that until you get past the pass, and the pass is pretty nondescript, you don't even know you're at a pass, uh, which is where the watersheds divide, so we suggest in the book that you climb up an old ancient cinder cone volcano called Tumac. And it was named after two Scottish uh, sheep herders. And, and it's also we should emphasize too that you know, 100 years ago, a lot of the national forest uh, lands were, were open to, to, to sheep grazing. And as, as John Muir would call the, the land locusts, they were all over the place there, or, or, or cattle grazing. But you, could, you can come up, you can hike up on, on the cinder cone, and the views are spectacular. And then all of a sudden you realize you look down below, and yes, it's a plateau with all these lakes. And then as you look farther out, Beyond the plateau here, looking to the east, you can you know see some incredible relief. Uh, this, these are um, the Mount Aches and Bismarck, um, the Nelson Ridge area, uh, incredible mountains in here. This whole area was named after William O. Douglas, who um, the Supreme Court Justice, grew up in Yakima, longest serving justice up till 1975 from FDR to, to, to Nixon. Uh, he was a, a great outdoorsman, spent a lot of time in this area and down uh, in that valley down below is Goose Prairie where he had a, where he had a cabin. So um, again, so many aspects of our, of our history uh, in here. It's not just one story to be told on, on each of these hikes. So we'll take it far west and back to the water. Um, one of the new hikes, hikes plural in the book are on um, San Juan Island. And in a sense, these are not ancient trails, but they are trails at a site of, of, of great historical interest. Um, you probably you may have heard the story of the pig war. Um, the boundary which resulted uh, from the boundary dispute between uh, the US and Great Britain as to where the boundary between the two um, British Canada and the US should be. And they agreed after some, uh, after a presidential election and some wrangling that it would be on the 49th parallel. And they sent a boundary crew out to mark the, uh, 
route. Um, uh, there is a boundary, parts of a boundary trail in the state. Um, only hiked one small part of it and didn't decide to include it. But when they got to the water and the coast, the big question is, well, what happens to this line in the water? It's not a line on a map anymore. You have a group of farms, of uh, islands, I'm sorry. And whether the um, boundary line went through Rosario Strait or Harrow Strait determined whether the San Juan Islands would be in US or uh, British possession. Um, and both countries uh, wanted it. Uh, the British, of course, were already on Vancouver Island. And even though it dips below the 49th parallel, no one objected to that remaining British. But uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had a big uh, agricultural farm uh, on the island. But American settlers thought this would be a great place to farm too. So a man named Lyman Cutler um, had a potato patch uh, on the island. And he didn't fence it um, terribly well, and a, a pig, a British pig, a marauding pig, kept getting in the potato pat, uh, patch, and he shot it. And that became an international incident, um, because this was British property that this American was, was um, shooting. So they agreed to, um, I'll go back to this for a minute, um, they agreed uh, that they would establish two military camps on the island while international diplomacy sorted out who would get the San Juan Islands. So for 12 years, we had English camp um, on one end of the island and American camp on the other. And this is English camp, the very sheltered bay on the northernmost uh, end of, of the uh, island. And it was a very civilized place. Um, they had a formal garden, which was put in, uh, they took out the uh, soldier's vegetable garden and planted a formal flower garden for the wife of the commander who was out in this uh, frontier area and they wanted to make her feel more comfortable. So they have a formal garden uh, and barracks and, and um, people came from Vancouver Island to visit here because it was uh, such a good place to be. Um, and, if, and one thing that uh, the officers could do at English camp is ride up uh, a hill called Young Hill. There was a gazebo here. They come back, uh, come up on horseback, uh, and watch the sunset set over Garrison Bay. Um, and I'm going to just start us with American camps on the southern end of the island. Much different kind of place. Uh, the U.S. refused to put much money into this uh, to make their their folks comfortable. This is uh, a structure that's still left at American camp. But what I love about American camp actually is just the open spaces that you can roam and the view. So, great. Yeah, no, it, it's important. You know, Judy mentioned Amer the Americans didn't put a lot of money into this, and they certainly um, nobody really wanted to go to war. We just came off the Civil War, and, and the last thing we want to do is go you know, is fight a third war with the British. So, um, you know, what what happened? Most of these guys they were here for 13 years, joint occupation, and a lot of times they were bored. But they actually got together and played games, and it really wasn't that hostile. Um, and you will notice the difference because uh, the British camp is is agreeable. It's, it's 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 classic British, and the American camp is a little more rugged. It's classic American. Um, but the land itself is very different, and the the American camp is all open. It's prairie, uh, and and what's seen. I think a lot of times we. We don't realize how many prairies were, are, were in uh, Western Washington. Uh, a lot of them were kept open front by Native people, uh, but so many have been developed, uh, invasives. And in this case, a lot of the Native plants are still here, but there's invasive rabbits <laughs> all over the place that were introduced. Um, so you'll know, you'll see that when you go around. But the views are incredible. You can hike down. Uh, so we talk about two, basically two hikes you can do at American Camp, British Camp, about the same distance. They're really easy hikes. They're, they're both less than three miles, very little elevation. It really gives you a nice taste of, of this area that's administered by the National Park Service now. But you can get into these wonderful beaches. Um, you know, it's all protected now. This became a park in 1965. If it wasn't, it would be all developed. And then here's, here's a, again, a great view of looking at that. And this outlet, Mount Finlayson, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the distance there, trails go up there. And when it's cool, you get this incredible view looking south over the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, and, and, and again, this is a great place you don't think about when you're hiking. It's a good place to go whale watching. We actually have areas you can hike looking for whales, orcas, gray whales when they're migrating, lots of good places for birds. Uh, and it's just, again, that, uh, you, 
besides the historical area, it was, it's, we look at it now as a beautiful place, but when, when they were stationed there, they really want, it was, it was, it was an outpost and, and there was nothing to do there and they'd much rather have been in a, in a far more civilized place. So um, enjoy it. And, and, and we're just thankful if they, there wasn't this big war that we wouldn't even have this place protected. So it's uh, the spoils of war worked in our favor here. And they did eventually. Uh, so I think they brought in Kaiser Wilhelm to uh, settle this dispute and gave uh, the San Juan Islands to the U.S., of course, and the Gulf Islands then to the British. So. Right. And the Gulf Islands, again, with a little aside, uh, you were talking earlier about the Deception Pass. Uh, that was another one of those misnomers. Uh, when Vancouver was looking out, they thought there was a gulf that went up there, and that's how the Gulf Islands got their name. Actually, it's the Strait of Georgia, and eventually. So again, it, it, there's there's some great mappers, but uh, a lot of these misnomers now the names of it. So you know, people always say, "Why are they called Gulf, the Gulf Islands?" But whatever you do, do not go to British Columbia and call them the Canadian San Juan Islands. Okay, they're the Gulf Islands. Okay. So we're going to take you back up into the mountains. Um, Craig mentioned the Jack Kerouac on Desolation Peak, but um, and that was that that hike is in the first uh, edition, but this time we decided to give a little more attention to Gary Snyder and Phil uh, Whalen, who are also uh, so called poets on the peak. There's a great book uh, called Poets on the Peak, and it's it started uh, pretty much with um, Gary Snyder. He grew up in the Northwest, went to Reed College, he roomed with Phil Whalen. Uh, he went hiking in the 50s with Jack Kerouac and the Sierras, and he persuaded Whalen and Kerouac to become lookouts during the summer. He said that the Skagit country was the greatest place in America, and they could come um, up to uh, spend the summer uh, looking for fires, but also writing poetry and being inspired by what they saw. Um, but going back before they, they got there in the 50s, before that, you will see in this um, photo by Craig of the trail up the Sourdough Mountain, uh, a peak called Davis Peak in the background. And that's named after uh, Lucinda Davis and her son, uh, Glee Davis. Lucinda Davis came, uh, she was a single woman with three kids. She came from Colorado, 1890, opened a store in the Diablo area uh, for miners, uh, a lot of mining uh, rushes going on at that time. And she and her son Glee would occasionally ride up horseback on the south side of uh, Sourdough Mountain for a picnic. Sourdough Mountain itself being named for the uh, dough starter for sourdough bread that was essential for miners. And as they rode up, they started stacking cairns at the top. Eventually, Glee was working for the US Forest Service, and he chose sourdough as the area's first lookout because of its sight lines and its views down um, to range. So uh, let's continue. So Whalen is, is on, um, uh, he's a lookout in 1953, 1954, 1955, and you see him here on the steps of Sourdough Lookout, which is still, still there, right? This is the one hike in the book I have not done. <laughs> so I, I think the book out is still there, is that right? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's okay. a <laughs> All right, let's talk about it. Um, you know, it's funny, Judy may have, may not have done this hike, but I've done it multiple times because it's one of my favorite hikes. I actually did this hike for the first time in 1985 while I was still living in New England. I came out here for the summer, do some hiking. I met the fire lookout on top, who was, a, who was a big Kerouac fan, and he found out that I lived in the Merrimack Valley and we became great friends. So I have this connection that goes all the way back. But I love this mountain. I've actually have it in several of my books. I consider it one of the 100 classic hikes of Washington, specifically for that view. This view is unbelievable. Uh, but here's the catch. This, as we'd say back in the old Italian neighborhood, is going to kick your culo because this is 11 mile round trip, 5,100 vertical feet. This is not an easy hike. Um, so you got to, it, it's, it's a great conditioner and you get up there, but you're going to, you're going to see why it was a wonderful place to put. Uh, a, a lookout uh, because you're just getting this 360 degree view of some of the most rugged peaks in North America. This is looking south and, and this, it, the, this is Diablo Lake, which has been dammed, the Skagit. Um, there's a whole series of dams here. Uh, that water is from the glacial till, the way the light uh, ref refracts on it. It's just incredible. But that's looking up Thunder, um, up Thunder Creek, which is a bustling with mining activity in the late 1800s. A lot of the early settlers had come up for that reason. 
a lot, a lot of history. And this is looking north, that peak way in the distance here. You see that is Hosamine, uh, just very close to the British Columbia border. That was the peak that Mr. Kerouac was so enthralled with, Hosamine, Hosamine, the prettiest peak I've ever seen. He was, his lookout was a lot closer to it. Uh, and you can make that hike too. Uh, it's a long hike, um, unless you take the water taxi and then you're still, it's gonna kick your butt as well. It's about another 11 mile round trip with uh, 48, 4,900 feet of vertical to get up there as well. Um, so out of the four poets on the peak, there were four of them, four lookouts. Two of the, of the lookouts are still in existence, one in Crater Mountain and on Soccer, no longer there, but they're, they're great hikes as well too. So uh, fascinating history of the beatnik poets here, but these lookouts go back to the 1920s and 30s. And we have some of their poetry in the book too. <laughs> they wrote about being lookouts, very beautiful description of what it's like. I got to desolation. That was my <laughs> that was the toughest time to do it. And there was no North Cascade Highway back then either. So it was really, really um, remote. Uh, that's the thing, the road. So the North Cascade Highway wasn't uh, open until 1972. And there was no North Cascade National Park until 1968. Okay, one more. Um, this is taking us to Eastern Washington. Um, you saw earlier a picture of the White Bluffs. This is the White Bluff Ferry. Uh, the U.S. military had developed a, a, a sort of road uh, from White Bluffs uh, on the Columbia River to connect military uh, posts on the plateau. Uh, the reason they couldn't continue up the Columbia River um, was because of rapids, particularly the Priest Rapids. And so they began to look for an overland route uh, for the military. And then later the Oregon Steam and Navigation Company wanted to haul freight. Uh, over the Saddle Mountains too, to get to mining fields in Caribou and, and Montana. Always the mining discoveries are kind of dri driving transportation. It's like, you know, you have a discovery and then you got to figure out how to get there. You got to get cattle there on a cattle trail. And uh, in this particular um, road, they also hauled a steamboat um, by mule train in parts. They sewed it in parts and they had the boiler and they carried it by mule over the Saddle Mountains. The old town of White Bluffs was on the, uh, this is the White Bluffs on the east side of the river. On the west side was the old town of White Bluffs. Um, the ferry came across there and at its peak at this ferry landing, you, there were 50 mule teams, uh, each of them with maybe 10 mules operating from the landing and they could each carry about 5,000 pounds of freight. Uh, the cattle also crossed here, they were swum across the river on the way to the mining camps. And if you go there today, of course, we know some of the history of uh, what happened at White Bluffs. Um, the road itself lasted for only about five years in the 1860s. And uh, it was eclipsed by the Mullen Road, which is also in the book, portions of it, which went uh, farther east from uh, Walla Walla towards Spokane, became a, a more traveled road. But, and then of course, what happened to White Bluffs um, in 1943, the US government came to the homesteaders there who had built orchards, uh, uh, two towns, Hanford and White Bluffs uh, on this side, on the west side of the river and said, you have to, you have to leave. We have, we can't tell you what we're doing here, but we're taking the land. Um, so today you can look across the, the river. This is uh, a zoomed in photograph and see some of the remains of um, the town of White Bluffs. Uh, there's a, a nice book mentioned in, uh, in, our, in our hiking book called Goodbye White Bluffs. Uh, it was a, a difficult move uh, for the people there. And you can tell us a little bit more about the hike. Yeah, this, this area is absolutely fascinating. A lot of people don't even think about it from a hiking perspective. And as Judy was saying too, uh, there used to be two towns there, Hanford and White Bluffs. The government took the took the land um, and you know, that's the Manhattan Project would go on there. And that's a whole another story. Uh, and from the Bluffs, you can actually see some of the old reactors and everything in there. But one of the, one of the reasons why, why they, uh, the government was interested in this area, they needed an area that didn't have any development around it. And what had happened in the year, by the year 2000 is that we realized we had this in 200,000 acres surrounding the Hanford uh, reservation of, of shrub step that had had not been touched and and this was an incredible opportunity to preserve this and that became under uh, President Clinton um, the Hanford Reach National Monument. Uh, so it, that part is open to the public. You can't go into the you know where the old reactors are, but you can hear and the trails here are incredible. And you look at this and think, oh my God, it looks so desolate. There's only about seven inches of rain that falls here a year. 
go there in the spring, it's just incredible, the flowers, the life, and you'd be surprised how much wildlife is in there. There's pelicans and elk and you know, five different types of jumping mice and everything. But the trail is just you go along these 300 foot blocks. Um, and, and this is, and I should also uh, emphasize that the stretch of river here, it's 53 miles long. It's the longest undammed non-tidal section left of the Columbia River. I mean, from its inception in, in the Rocky Mountains all the way to the gorge, the Columbia has been harnessed. So this is one of the few areas you can see a free flowing Columbia River. Uh, so again, to experience it, to try to go back into this time. And then again, once you're on those dunes, you're on the, on the bluffs, you see this complex dunes. Uh, you know, there's nothing like this. I've seen even in coastal areas, an incredible dune complex. They're always shifting and changing. And then there's little hummocks and pocket, pocket wetlands in the area. And again, the wildlife, I've never seen so many swallows built their, their nests built in, into this area. And as I mentioned earlier, pelicans. It's an incredible place to see pelicans in the state too. Um, so it never gets crowded. It can be uh, you know, bloody hot there. Uh, so you want to definitely go there in, in, in the springtime or, or, or in the fall. Um, and there's no need to really worry about rattlesnakes or anything. It's too hot for them too. They're going to be, they're going to be down below. So um, great areas, but there's, you can also, um, you can find some of the old, um, the old um, carriage roads and the old trails in, in that area. Uh, and then this is uh, an old road that was abandoned. This is also part of the Hanford Reach. You, you also will see old settlements there. Wherever you see, you look down below, you see these trees growing lots of times. They're locust trees that were native to, uh, to the Midwest or south, south or the southern part of the U.S. A lot of the, um, the uh, settlers brought these trees with them. They're fast growing. They use them for posts and everything. So you can see relics where people had settled just by some of the trees that were left behind. Uh, and, and this is a great area to explore too. And nature, as you can see, is taking, uh, taking back this part of the road as well. Uh, so I hope we, we've intrigued you to get out here and, and explore. These are just four stories of the more than 40 that we tell in, in the book uh, of all, all different aspects of the history of our state through, through our trail system. You can find out a little bit more about us <laughs> and the book on our two websites. Um, and there's the book. And definitely so a copy, yes, at the University Bookstore. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll want a copy of this. So Dwayne, we're happy to take questions. Yeah, we look at the chat box right now here. Um, most of them are saying nice things about congratulations on the book. Let me go scroll back up here. Uh, well, so it's mostly all this nice things about you and the books and the link and uh, let's see here. I think it's a lot. Dwayne, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the Oh, the Q&A one, I was gonna chat. Okay, here we go. Um, they want to know if all the pictures you've been showing Judy are inside the book. If all the pictures, almost all. Um, one of those historical pictures is not in the book. Not all of them because, um, for example, Sourdough Mountain, there's only maybe, uh, you know, we chose one, there's usually just one color picture per height. So uh, I'm Craig provided a lot more for the, for the talk. So. They're not all in the book, but many of them are. We have a lot of historical photos in the book too, some great uh, archive photos. Uh, again, usually, yeah, you get to see a contemporary shot of the actual beauty of what you're gonna see. And then uh, a, a really great historical photo too that kind of captures what we're, you know, what we're trying to convey uh, the mood and the story of the place. Um, a lot of this has been driven by mining, as you said. Do any of the trails go very close to the old mines, or is there that is that more of a remnant we don't see anymore? Well, that Black Warrior mine um, goes right up to the entrance. You can even go into it if you dare. Photographed yeah, it from inside the mine. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. Some of my, but but in a lot of mines, they're not safe to, to hike, and it's usually advisable not to go in in the in the old right. shaft. But you can certainly hike up to up to them. Uh, and you don't even want to go into a lot of them. A lot of them have been sealed off, and there's, there's always hazardous gases and things that can that can be there. Um, um, well, on the Red Town well, Trail, oh, yeah. there's an entrance to the Ford Slope Mine. I mean, it's blocked, but you can see how there's a rail car sitting there that shows you how the how the cars went into the mine. So you can see mine entrances, but okay. One of your fans wants to know if you have any easier walks to recommend than. The challenging ones. You're mostly talking about the ones that like Craig was like, well, I'll kick your butt. <laughs> oh, that was just one. That was just one hike. The, the San Juan hikes, those are less than, than three miles. They're they're very kid friendly, very family friendly. The Hanford, the Hanford hike, even on the bluff, you can just you can go 
four miles one way or just go a half one mile. A lot of the hike, I mean, we have different levels. There's obviously, there are hikes in the book that are, are quite in depth, they're multi-day, or you could do sections of them. But no, um, you know, again, you know, we're looking at the, his, the historical aspect is, 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 the, is the most important thing here, but there's plenty of easier hikes. And certainly the ones uh, over in Newcastle, the coal, Cold Creek area right outside of Seattle are, are very family friendly hikes. And we mentioned that in the, in the book too, um, the, the, the difficulty of them. A lot of these are, are easy. We yeah, label them by difficulty. Yeah. I, and you mentioned, Craig, the Snoqualmie Valley Trail, which goes on for miles and is, is a very gentle, but, but very enjoyable mm -hmm. hike. Uh, the West Duwamish Greenbelt Trail is not difficult and short and fairly accessible in Seattle too. So. Uh, it is a mixture. I mean, the longest one, I think, is the Elwa, uh, is the uh, press right. expedition down the Elwa. That's a multi-day backpacking trip for most of us. But you can um, still do it, just day hikes. You can still hike the, first, the northern few miles of that. Go, there's amazing amounts of history in there. There's a lot of cabins, pioneer cabins. And stuff. So again, you don't have to do the entire trails on, on a lot. You can just do parts of them as well. Um, so that's, that's key also. I'd say Northrop Canyon is also a, a very easy, easy one into pretty um, amazing scenery for someone from Western Washington, particularly. And the Cape Flattery, that Cape Flattery Trail, is, I mean, you have to drive forever to get there, but uh, the trail itself is almost less than, it's about half a mile, quarter of a mile hike. So. Quarter of a mile, yeah. Um, We've got a couple of new questions here for our out of time. One of them wants to know if, uh, if you're concerned that any of the hikes might have things, hikers might either damage the historic features that we talked about or remove artifacts from the area? There's always that possibility. Um, the Iron Goat Trail has artifacts and people have been, uh, you, you, had, you do have to educate people to be respectful of them. Even the tin cans on the Northrop Canyon Trail that's uh, protected state parks property. <laughs> These are tin cans left up supposedly by laborers on the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, um, I'm fairly, sorry. Got a fairly technical question here. It says the Khaled's Trail sounds very intriguing. Is it practical to hike this trail from the Khaled's Valley near Packwood to the PCT? And is there any momentum to bringing back the trail on the east side of the crest? Why don't you take the first part and I'll talk about the east side, Greg. Yeah, um, can you hike it from Packwood? Was that the question? Um, to my knowledge, there's really no connecting trails. You can go, there is a trail on the south side, the Clear, and it's Clear, Creek, Clear Creek Trail, a Clear Fork Trail. You can kind of connect it. Uh, I wouldn't. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's unfortunately a lot of the historic trails were truncated, uh, and, and in many cases were lost due to logging or development or private land, such like that. So in this case, and it also should be um, stated, just like the... Um, the, the Camino in, in Europe, there's, there, there was many uh, feeding trails that went to these one trail. So, so when we talk about one, one way, uh, uh, College Pass, there were several feeding trails that, that, that went in there uh, you know, to the main area. And this is kind of the core of where it is. You might be able to replicate um, walking some of those areas on old roads and everything. Uh, and certainly, you know, you're a hardcore story and you do it, but I don't think it's going to be a pleasurable hiking experience in, in some cases. There, there's a big effort underway, actually, though, to track the trail um, by Gifford Pinchot, uh, National Forest folks. Um, and on the east side, uh, Ray um, and Sue Paolello, who uh, have a website on the William, what they call the William O. Douglas Trail, has been tracking uh, Douglas's routes from Yakima up into the mountains. And uh, Ray in particular has done a lot of, he thinks he knows where the old trail was. Um, you have to Florida Creek. Um, he's been looking for landmarks, but it, actually in the past five years, there've been some real efforts to try and complete, uh, or at least map the trail from the uh, east side. Uh, from the west side, there's a clear cut area that, that's private property you can't go through. Um, but, and there's an amazing amount of research that has been done to track it from uh, from even uh, west of Packwood, but not hikeable. I mean, that, that that four to five mile segment up to Callitz Pass from Soda Springs Campground is the is the most uh, hikeable and identifiable part. And it's protected in federal wilderness too, so there's no threat of it being logged or developed. Um, you're not going to encounter dirt bikes on it, so it's. it's it's protected. 
I'm got no open questions at the moment. Do either of you have anything else you want to say before we run out of time? Yeah. You know, there's still so much that I'm constantly, I, I studied history at the University of Washington and you go out there, trails. I mean, I think Judy can probably say the same thing. We're, we're still students of, of history too. We're constantly learning new things going out there. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, in, in, in every time you hit the trail, there's a sense of discovery. And I would just say that I realized, John, how much we built on the work of, of trail advocates and um, volunteer groups, um, national parks and state forest and national forest folks and local historical societies. I mean, th this has been a, a community a, a effort. Um, I didn't think there would need to be a second edition. I thought we hit all the historic trails, but no, there's some, <laughs> there are some discoveries. There's some new ones uh, and um, worth hiking so that we can pre preserve them and love them. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions, so I think we'll probably call it a night. It's been lots of fun. I wish we could have done it in person. I'm hoping uh, we'll be doing the real events in the store this fall in terms of having the authors and the fans, and we'll have that that uh, camaraderie. It's just not quite the same on Zoom, although it's nice to be able to meet people that might not be in the immediate area. I've had fans come in and join from all the way, so thank you all for attending. Thanks to Judy and Craig, and good night to all of you. Okay.